Welcome to Maneuvering Music, a vocal music podcast based at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. My name is Carrie Sullivan, and I am pleased to be your host for today's episode. Today, we'll be talking about some different types of higher education music schools and what sets them apart. The difference between studying music at the University of Colorado and at Rice University in Austin, Texas, is that the former is a liberal arts college, whereas the latter houses a conservatory of music. When many students are first applying to school for music, one of their biggest questions is how are these two types of music education different? Conservatories and liberal arts schools have many similarities and differences which set them apart, and help students make a choice that best suits their individual talents and interests. Neither is better or worse than the other. They simply provide education of different flavors. Conservatories come in two forms. Either they are separate programs housed within a larger university, such as the College Conservatory of Music at the University of Cincinnati, or they exist on their own as institutions, like the Juilliard School or Berklee College of Music. Liberal arts music programs aren't separated from the rest of the university. When you ask for a generic comparison of the two, a few basic differences are listed. At liberal arts schools, students can pursue additional majors and minors which do not belong to the music program, such as psychology, English, or mathematics. At conservatories, the focus on studying performance is much more intense and focused. Liberal arts students are required to take traditional general education courses such as math and science, and conservatory students are not. But are those statements really true? Today, we've invited some students from both types of universities to talk about their experiences attending school for music. Now let's go have a discussion about the similarities and differences of conservatories and liberal arts colleges. All right, so I guess let's start by going around and introducing ourselves and saying um, where we go to school or went to school and what kind of music school it is, since that's what we're talking about um, in this episode. Um, Obviously, as I said in the intro, my name's Carrie. I go to Miami University, um, and it is considered a liberal arts college. So who wants to go next? (laughs) I'll go ahead. Uh, My name's Nate Wilkins. Um, I'm the president of the opera at Miami University, and Miami University is, again, a liberal arts college. Hi, I'm Maddie Fitzpatrick. I just graduated from New England Conservatory in 2020, which would have been this year, and that is a conservatory, and I'm going to MSM this upcoming fall, and that is a school of music. I'm Sam. I go to Capital University, which is a liberal arts university, but within that there is a conservatory of music. Great. So I was looking at um, a photo that was taken towards the end of the fall semester at Miami um, of all of the the voice majors. Um, I I counted, I individually counted every person in this photo who was a voice major, and this is uh, music performance and music ed, and I counted 43, um, you know, plus or minus five, I don't know who was or wasn't there that day, but, um, so 43 people, music performance and music ed, that's pretty much the size of Miami University's voice program, and we have, um, how many studios do we have now, Nate? Uh... Currently, we have four, I want to say, but that's uh, subject subject to possible change. I'm not sure off the top of my head perfectly whether or not we're bringing in new teachers or not. So right. currently, right. we have yes. four large teachers, large studios. Yes, yes. So the four studios um, split up 
among, you know, 40 to 50 students. How does that, does that sound like really big to you guys going to conservatories or really small or what's the difference? For me, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. For me, that sounds uh, pretty similar. Um, uh, quite honestly, um, every week we have these, um, recital hour performances and they're split between instrumental and vocal and when I'm thinking of the vocal recital hours um, that sounds about right for about uh, how many people are in the audience which are also all the students and teachers um, and as far as vocal studios go um, certainly some are bigger than others um, but I believe we, we have even a few more than that, um, despite being a smaller school. Um, I think one of the biggest differences as far as capital goes is that the conservatory, while it might be about the same size as um, your College of Music in, at Miami, it um, is much bigger in proportion to the school. Yeah, that's true, because Capital is way, 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 way smaller than Miami, yeah, obviously. about yeah. 2,500 people. Wow, that's, yeah. wow. <laughs> that's like how many people went to my high school. That's crazy. Right. Um, right. right. So then, are your studios, um, I, don't, I don't even know, like, are your studios, you have a lot of studios, but is there only, like, a few students in each? My studio has, I think, four or five singers, but we have a mm -hmm. studio that has, you know, 20 or 30, so. Yeah, yeah I, I think am, Allison's, like, 17. Give I'm take, in the students. largest studio um, by quite a bit, um, and I th she definitely has at least 15 students. Okay, so around the same. Maddie, what were you going to say? Um, well, so when I got to NEC in 2016, it, uh, they introduced 75 new students, um, oh. as a total. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, so it usually ranges from 50 to 100. Keep in mind, the school is about a block. That's how big NEC is at, in Boston. Um, okay. my vocal performance class of, that got in in 2016 was about eight individuals, uh, not including myself. And... Yeah, there were there were a few studios. Um, I got the opportunity to kind of figure out how big some of them were, depending on because my teacher, um, she was the chair for a little bit. And so she would often get these crazy amount of students. So we'd either have like 20 students in her studio and then the next year, halfway through the semester, she stepped down from being the chair and we had eight in the studio. So our studio size differed greatly, but um, at MSM, for what I understand, uh, in their grad program at least, uh, they live auditioned over a thousand individuals and took 400. So it's a much bigger school, but uh, yeah. I'm not sure how big the grad voice department is for that one or how that divides, but yeah, that's my input. Well. On that, how many grad students do you think there were at um, NEC? Um, you could count them on your, like, I'd say 20, 30. Okay, in proportion, that'd be like, what, I don't know. But I, that's the amount that I saw that were voice. Right, so in proportion to the other voice students, that'd be like, what, a, uh, I don't know, 30% of the undergrads, give or take? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely a lot less for the grad students, but... Um, but that's still much more than we have at Miami. We have, like... <laughs> three grad students at a time <laughs> right take, you know? right exactly yeah I mean when I was applying to schools I was told you know like something that you're gonna have to consider is like are you gonna get roles is it gonna be full of you know grad students and I definitely applied to some schools where there it was undergrad only you know and that was like oh you'll be able to get roles because there won't be grad students like you know taking all of them because <laughs> they're much better than the undergrads are but then I got to Miami where that wasn't the case and there's I was like, where's all the grad students? <laughs> like, yeah. there's only like three of them. I mean, they're all amazing, but there's not that many of them, so. Absolutely. Well, the cool thing about NEC is the performance opportunities that they have for the undergrads. So one of the teachers, the studio teachers, they created this thing called UGOS, which is an undergraduate opera program. 
Um, and they gave the opportunity for the students to make, they have scenes in the fall for the underclassmen that they can perform. And then in the spring, they have the seniors and very lucky juniors perform an opera or acts from an opera, which is really, really cool. But uh, I don't know how many schools do that, though. I, I, I've heard that. I think that... a lot do, I know. actually. Um, I know CCM has really an undergraduate opera. For it, though. I know CCM has an undergrad opera. Uh, I think um, Miami does, too. Or not Miami. Well, um, Oh, maybe Miami. Well, uh, not I'm really. Sam. <laughs> MSM, sort yeah. of. <laughs> I mean, because there's not many grad exactly. students, most <laughs> undergrads are the participants in the opera. Um, I'd say a lot of the schools do undergraduate. I don't know that Jacobs School of Music does, which is another large school that I looked up. I looked at. I think they have a lot of. They're like, their music school is about as big as your school, Sam. Like, <laughs> Jacobs School of Music is about as <laughs> yeah, big as. Canada. I believe it. So, they have a lot of people and they do like four or five operas a year. Mm -hmm. So they, they put on like almost as much as a professional opera house does. So they right. have a lot more opportunities when it comes to that. But do you know, Nate, is that a liberal arts school? Oh, I'm, it's, is, it's a it school is, of music. Right? So it's not a conservatory. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it'd be liberal arts. It's the Jacob okay. school of music. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I applied there. <laughs> I, yeah. I almost went, but it was too, too large. Too much. Yeah, I, I, same here, actually. I almost went to Jacob's as well, but the teacher I wanted wasn't available, and I wasn't going to leave myself to the hands of fate, as it were, when it came to Absolutely teachers. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, so some schools have, like, a ton of performance opportunities like that. I mean, they're huge, and they have the students to have four or five operas. If Miami did four or five operas, like, <laughs> almost all of the voice students are in the one opera, I think we would probably die if they did more than one, so... Well, we'd need more than one director, too, because Ben's overworked enough when it comes to the opera oh, absolutely. as it is, you know? I think they absolutely. have several directors and several... You know, they have enough staff to put on that many operas, and they have enough of a budget to put on that many operas, because operas are not cheap, nor are they particularly large money makers when it comes to return on investment. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Sam, what does the opera schedule look like or, you know, the performance schedule sort of look like at Capitol? What what experience do you have with that? Um, as far as operas go, um, you probably wouldn't want to go to Capitol if you wanted an opera focus um, because what we have is we have an opera slash musical theater class, which means that um, semester by semester we alternate between um, some sort of opera showcase and a musical theater show. Um, and um, you can either major in vocal performance or you can major in vocal performance with emphasis in opera and musical theater, which means you just perform more. Okay, so you basically choose how much performance opportunities you want when you apply. Um, Is that what you're saying? Because um, when you take the degree with emphasis, you have to take the opera musical theater class every semester throughout your entire stay. If it's just book performance, you only have to do it once or twice. Um, however, every semester you do have to perform at uh, one of the recital hours, hmm. but you can perform at more if you want to. So only one per semester? Um, yes, one is required. There might be more for higher level performance. Uh, I haven't gotten there yet, so I'm not sure. That sounds pretty analogous to our forums that we have at Miami University. I'm sure you have something similar at NEC, don't you? Where like the uh, voice majors get in front and perform with each other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that. I think that's oh. a also Pretty week by week um, we alternate between the sectioned recital hours that I talked about split between instrumental and vocal and general recital hours which is the entire conservatory that mm. you perform before and I know that juniors and seniors are required to perform at um, at least one general per year. Mm. That sounds similar to sort of what we have at Miami except for um, Instead of, you know, the sectioned and the general, we have studio and forum. So studio is, you know, you get up and you perform in front of the people in your studio. Mm -hmm. um, and then so each studio has their own, like, separate meeting. And then forum is when 
all the voice majors gather in one um, room and we perform and it's a little bit less like a master class and more like an actual recital um so we we never do like we never gather all of the music majors i think there's just too many (laughs) um i don't know yeah i don't know why we don't do that i mean well i mean our recitals for the juniors and the seniors both put on solo recitals and i think our recital requirement because uh, we had to attend 14 recitals a semester, essentially, mm. uh, every mm. semester. We get like seven semesters of your year, you have to attend 14. So you get one skip semester. But besides that, all juniors put on a half recital and all seniors put on a full hour long recital. Same here. Um, I should also mention that um, at Capital, um, we do have studios on top of the recital hours. However, that's kind of up to the teacher to put on. It's not really like a consistent class. Um, So sometimes we may skip a week um, and it is more of a master class format. Um. Right. Maddie, did you want to add to that? Um, Well, if we're talking about the um, kinds of studio versus performance thing that we have going on, Mm -hmm. um, we do have the studio class in which we get to sit down at least once every week and it's more of a you go in and you put things up on their feet. It's not really performance kind of thing. And then um, for actual performance, we don't actually have something like that at NAC where you guys have like a forum. That's We usually have like a showcase at the beginning and end of the year for the freshmen. And that's mm-hmm. mostly it. For the performances for the juniors and seniors, we have full performances for each. Um, I think seniors get priority over rooms and yeah. halls and stuff like that. But aside from that, that's there's not really a difference between the performances. You mostly, seniors get priority, juniors get whatever's left. Well, don't you have uh, two people on the junior recitals usually? Oh, like yes, it's that's a, also it's true. It's a co-recital. I often forget because my uh, the person I did my junior recital with was a pianist. So, oh, I see. <laughs> oh okay. Uh, usually, uh, for a junior recital, you have to do it with a partner. So um, my partner was a pianist, so I often think of it as a... Um, <laughs> a full one. A, yeah. a full one, but... It's, a full uh, senior recital, yes. Yes, but um, my, for most people, they did it with... It was cut in half. So yes, it was cut in half for most people, um, in which someone would sing all of most of their important rep, and then the other one would get up and perform, or they'd mesh it together, or they'd do duets and stuff of the such. And it was it was something. And then the senior is all by yourself, and you'd hire a pianist either from the school or outside. And yeah, and I didn't get to do that. <laughs> Fair. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so COVID ruins it's, all plans. <laughs> right. Exactly. So it sort of seems like like something that I feel like is said is kind of maybe not that you get more performance opportunities. I mean, I don't know if it really is like sort of exclusive to a conservatory versus a liberal arts school. I think it depends on program size whether or not you're going to get performance opportunities and since conservatories are typically smaller in a lot of cases i I don't Mm -hmm. want to say that because it's not 100 percent true but um to be fair i mean i definitely left out a bunch of them um Mm -hmm. so the real thing about these kind of things is you have to look for them yourself yeah um and if you want to perform you have to you have to want to perform it's not something that's handed to you um, exactly. So, for example, um, we have an entrepreneurial musicianship department in which you can go and be like, I want to go perform for children in a school and teach them about... Um, Brahms. Yeah, I want to teach them about Mozart and Brahms, and we'll go ahead and I'll bring some musical instruments and we can all have fun in a kindergarten classroom. Or I want to go and do a charity fundraiser so I can help this, or I want to do caroling, and I want to send the proceeds to a homeless foundation, or something of the sort. Um, Of course, the EM department then picks out their favorites, and picks out which ones are just, I really just want to perform, please give me a performance opportunity, (laughs) Um, and then sends the ones that are actually going to help people, but that's definitely a way to get yourself out there, and then, of course, there are choir concerts in which you can definitely, it's mandatory for undergrads, um, 
and then you could definitely get a solo opportunity in there depending on what the repertoire is and what's going on there's so, a large composition department where you can get a lot of you can sing a lot of new works yeah, too right yeah yeah so um there's also the nec is divided into three different kinds of um people um the classical people the jazz and the contemporary improvisation and each of them produces composers and there's a composer comp or there's a composer concert at night on tuesdays and occasionally, if you befriend a composer, they will ask you to perform their pieces. So mm. they will set you up with everything you need, and you can perform in choirs, you can perform solo, you can perform... And they really do all kinds of instruments. It's really cool. Um, and that's something I really... I've done it a bunch of times, mostly choir, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was excellent. Um, mm-hmm. There, are, There are a lot of different opportunities at, in this specific conservatory. I'm not sure what other ones look like because i tend to believe that nec is nec is nec right (laughs) well i'd say uh between the i don't think there is a significant difference between a school of music and a conservatory when it comes to performance opportunities i'd say it depends mostly institution institution to institution i think the biggest differences between the two would be how people approach the study of music more than anything else you know i think conservatives tend to be or conservatories <laughs> conservatives <laughs> conservatories tend to be more focused on studying and making music whereas liberal arts schools tend to have a more holistic view of the entire process you know like mm-hmm. where ben might have us learn how to hang lights in a theater auditorium for our opera production i don't know that that would be mm-hmm. something that a conservatory would let their students do you know they have people for right. that Exactly. And that was something that I was going to bring up as well is sort of what is I'm wondering what is the difference between um, sort of the effort and the workload between conservatories, not conservatives, conservatories (laughs) and um, liberal arts schools. See, it happens every time. I always want to say conservatives. Um, (laughs) So I know that um, I mean, I've only been at Miami for one year, so I'm not, you know, totally there yet. But I know that the expectation from my teacher was to practice six days a week for one hour for every credit hour that you were in, um, you know, signed up for studio or like lessons for. So I had two credit hours um, for, you know, actual voice learning music and singing it. Um, so I was expected to practice two hours a day. Did I? No. Um, but I tried. Um, but that was sort of the expectation and it kind of, you know, it grows as you get older and as you are like, you know, preparing for your junior recital and preparing for your senior recital and stuff like that. I won't say that they were like lax on us just because, you know, we had other classes and, you know, it's not a conservatory, but um, I'm wondering if maybe it's more intense at places where it's more focused. Before we move on, I do want to mention that um, it is a little different too. Uh, and when we say practicing, people should not think that we're singing 12 hours in a week. That's what I was Because oh, there's yeah. only, you, you only have so many good singable hours in a week. Mm-hmm. And with yeah. ensembles and everything else, when we say practicing, when Carrie says practicing 12 hours, she means the inclusion of stuff like kitchen table work, as my teacher likes to call it, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. writing out your translations, making sure you understand how to pronounce each word in a piece, speaking the text, you know, um, getting your interpretation of the piece down. That all comes into practicing as well. I think my teacher told us we should really only be singing about five hours a week in a practice room, any more than that. And you're with the other, I don't know, we've She doesn't let us do more than two ensembles because otherwise we'll get too vocally tired. So choir, we sing about four hours a week traditionally, and opera can be another 10 hours a week. So, you know, yeah. on top, you probably only have about 20 good hours of singing in a week, I'd say, give or take. For me, I mean, there's definitely, I've done a few pedagogy classes to talk about what practice should be like and what practice and effort and what to do at a conservatory when you're constantly under the gun and (laughs) because honestly all you do at a all you do at a conservatory is music um there's not a whole lot else that you do the other the other things that you have to do would be learn your languages you do music history you do your entrepreneurial musicianship there's not a whole lot of other classes that you could take so i mean besides like some pop-up classes that's like art class or if you wanted to cross register to a class or like to a um 
to a college nearby. Like, for example, I did um, a cross-registration for a little bit to Northeastern and took French. But that's, that's the bare minimum um, that they're willing to give. And so with that knowledge, um, what I am able to do with this practice time is I totally agree with the five hours a week. That's very good. Um, honestly, from what I learned from pedagogy, it's 45 minutes of being able to Oh, there were words that I was able to use back in <laughs> school year, and now I'm summer brain. <laughs> Properly vocalizing. Um, <laughs> vocalizing, but it was more like, uh, it wasn't suspended singing, but it was like, well, there's silent singing, and there's um, ma not masked singing, or mass practice, distributed practice, all kinds of different methods for practicing that are available to you that help you get through, and obviously those words... I don't know if those translate, but um, along with breaks and other kinds of things that will just help prolong keep, your voice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Prolong staying alive when you're in the practice room. But if you're not in the practice room, also it's important for you to write down your lessons, write down what you remember, write down what you've learned, new things that you can try. Silent singing is a big thing that I do, and that's sitting at the piano and singing an octave low and just going through your pieces and making sure that you get them, getting each of the crescendos, decrescendos, each of the accents, each of the um, dynamics, just making sure that I understand everything that's on the paper, um, making sure that I understand the poetry word for word. I mean, living in the library was something that I did. I literally lived in the library. Like, <laughs> the library was just like my home at NEC. So practice was kind of something Absolutely. that I would do 24-7, whether it was singing or not. But to be actually singing, I think five hours yeah. was important. So That's also yeah. another point uh, I'd give to conservatories. They probably have much more impressive libraries than mm. the standard school of music's and a li liberal arts college. The NEC library was massive. It was, I got all of my Egyptian music from there. And it was just, they had a vault of all of this like old timey music that the composers that like built NEC from the ground up wrote. Mm. It, it was it's amazing and it's so cool and they keep them in these little oh my god <laughs> mm -hmm. sorry i'm geeking out so yeah i mean absolutely um all those types of practice are definitely um very valuable um in their own ways um and also encouraged at at miami so there was a similarity there i assume it was somewhat of the same concept at capital sam um, yeah, for us, it was about, um, uh, well, it depends, well, for all vocal students, um, you're expected to practice, um, at least five days a week. Um, an hour is recommended, but, you know, not required, uh, per practice session, so you don't vocally tire yourself, um, because, um, the choir that we're in demands a lot of us vocally. So, um, how much you are held accountable to this uh, practice uh, routine is, um, it's based on a practice sheet, um, but, you know, the teacher you have uh, will vary your experience with how much uh, expectations you have greatly. For sure. Mm -hmm. So well, I think it's... that I think that no, brings up ahead, a Nate. great point that the most important thing to me in a school, whether or not it's a conservatory or a liberal arts school, is your teacher. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a good teacher at either of the school, <laughs> your decision's not going to matter. You know, between a conservatory or a liberal arts school, so your teacher should be your first consideration in any deliberation when you're thinking about going to school for music. Completely yeah, and I mean, I I really don't see that big of a difference between them like uh you're just talking about library size i think miami has a better music library than we do um because we just have a, a small section within the one library on campus so um it it really does depend on just what school you're going to for sure for sure um so also Sam, I had talked to you um, about 
the fact that you go to a conservatory, technically, um, but you do also have general education requirements that you have to meet as well. And typically, when people are talking about the difference between a conservatory and a liberal arts school, one of the first things that they mention is like, oh, at a conservatory, you only study music, and at a liberal arts school, you have to like take math and English and science and stuff like that. So kind of, what, what does that look like at Capitol? Um, you definitely still have to take gen eds. You have the same, um, you have the same, um, gen ed program as everyone else at the university. Um, however, um, other degrees outside of the conservatory have a lot more electives, which means they will end up taking more gen eds, but there are not as many that are uh, specifically required. Um, also, in addition to that, um, a lot of these um, gen ed classes can, you, you can get uh, credit for whether it's credit hours or just completion credit before you even get there. Um, they're pretty lax on the um, requirements for that uh, because you can get out of like English and math with just a good enough SAT score, for example. So, um, so basically the conservatory has the same gen ed requirements, but you will end up doing less because of other factors. Maddie, what about your experience? Ooh, so we have a weird definition for gen ed. Um, the gen ed that we have is we have to take 40 of the 120 credits that we get uh, in either music history, liberal arts, which would have been either Italian, French, German, uh, or yeah, German and... Mostly languages then? Mostly languages language. would be liberal arts and um, entrepreneurial musicianship, which is, that's that's it. That's the game. <laughs> so those, those are, are all within music. Everything though. is within music at NEC. So you can, if you wanted to take out something outside, you could cross register to another school. Like I knew some friends that were art, they were artistic and they loved to paint or they loved to act and they loved to, they wanted to do something more with that. And they'd cross register to Northeastern and they'd go and they'd take painting classes or drawing classes, acting, or just take over the music department, you know. <laughs> like any New England conservatory, New England conservatory student would do, um, but yeah, that's mostly. We don't really have what a normal person would define as gen ed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I'd I say, mean Miami. Yeah, Miami. Yeah, we have <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, since I'm a senior now, I've had a little more experience with this. But most of our yeah. gen ed classes, when you think about that, there are some that the music school tries to cover with music curriculum sort of classes. Like for our, uh, we have like a diversity uh, gen ed, and we have like diversity in the or diversity in the world of music. I believe is what it is for our music class that fills for that. But we do all have to take classes outside of the department of music. So. For instance, I took a German class and it had nothing to do with lyric German, you know, or lyric diction at mm -hmm. all. I have a separate lyric diction class, but like, you know, or for instance, I think I'm going to take a class this semester. I'm trying to about like ancient cities and how they lived, you know, for part of my diversity in the world class, you okay. know? <laughs> yeah, we a lot of our classes are outside. But oh, they tend to be filled by other majors as well. If you decide to take a second major or a minor. The, I think that's the cool part about that, though. Yeah. Because you get all those options, you know? You do. You get a lot of options for it. Yeah. They try their best to make it as, you know, streamlined and as straightforward as possible. You know, you can fill your, your math credit by taking music technology, which is required for music students anyway. Um, but... Yes, that is true it counts um, as math. for the audience. Yep. Maddie is very shocked by this yes. discovery. <laughs> but yes, um, music technology does count as your math credit, but also you can't take a music class for like your physical science lab. So like there's some stuff that you do have to do. That actually does make um, a, a bit of sense. Um, is there's a lot of like um, equations in math that I had to take in my intro to music tech 
class. So it's not as ridiculous as it sounds, um, but yeah, definitely a little different than just straight up taking a math class. Isn't it amazing? I should say <laughs> it's so. The, it's the best. Um, so, I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of delineation there, but again, it really depends on what school you go to, it sounds like. So um, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that at Miami, I don't know why I just pronounced it in yeah. two very distinct <laughs> syllables like that, at Miami, um, non-majors can participate very heavily in the music program. So we have some, um, most of our ensembles are open to non-music majors. Um, and I'm sure there are other music classes that they can participate in as well. Um, a lot of our classes are locked to majors simply because like we have to take them and there has to be space for all of our majors to actually take the classes they have to take. Mm -hmm. But there is room for a lot of participation um, from people outside of the College of Creative Arts. So I'm wondering if what's what the situation is like, um, especially at, at Maddie's school, but at Sam's school as well, in terms of non-majors. Yeah. I was just going to qualify before we continue on that those are mainly for the level 100 and 200 courses at Miami. Okay. Um, so yeah, at NEC, there are actually, since everyone's a musician, uh, there are non-major courses that you can take. So there can be like piano for non-majors or jazz for non-majors or improvisation for non-majors. It's actually really cool because it gives you the opportunity to try things that you never would, that you can for an entire semester. Um, <laughs> uh, I actually did, I did piano for voice majors, which was kind of the same thing, I guess. Um, I also did piano for non-majors, so piano for voice majors was required, excuse me. Um, but an example of this would be, I for ensembles, um, I had a friend named Tom. And he was my best friend at NEC, and he was a contemporary improvisation major. He has his own band, he plays guitar, he does all the techie stuff, and he performs. So, like, he'd go to, like, little places for, like, brunches and all kinds of places. He'd sing Beatles songs, but he also wrote his own music. Um, but he wanted to participate in Chamber Singers, which is our audition choir at NEC and they allowed him to audition and he got in. So he was in Chamber Singers for an entire year, which is primarily a classical vocalist group that all the classical singers have to participate in. But he, yeah, he was a great addition. He was a great tenor. And since he was a musician, he got in and he did what he was doing. And yeah, and I think that we're all very inclusive and it was a good time. <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think the moral of the story is, I think the moral of the story is, is that if you want to do something, you can do it if you want it hard enough, you know, exactly. at a lot of these schools. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that goes pretty much same for Capital. Um, I don't think there's really any restrictions on non-majors taking any um, conservatory courses or um, ensembles. Um, it, it just kind of depends on the class. You know, you're not going to see a lot of non-majors in class keyboard two, uh, but you know, in choir, there's certainly a handful of, um, non-majors there. Um, and there are some conservatory classes that are specifically catered toward non-majors, like, uh, history of rock and roll, for example, mm -hmm. yeah. which helps them receive their elective credits, you know. Oh, speaking of choir, I just want to stick that in there. That just reminded me, if that wasn't already evident, uh, the choir at NEC, the basic uh, concert choir, is anyone that can't fit in an orchestra. So I suppose that does include all the non-majors, if that makes sense. So you have the guitarists, the, composi the composers, the compositionists. Mm -hmm. I almost yeah. said compositionists. <laughs> Technically, I did. Um, <laughs> the pianists, the... Yeah, everything else that doesn't fit in the box, so... <laughs> yeah, I think that's... Uh, ensemble requirements are pretty p common amongst most yeah. of the schools where everybody... We have to be in an ensemble every semester, and I think that's mm -hmm. pretty general. Generally the same across most music schools, so... Just thought I'd throw it in mm -hmm. there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so conversely, can you, as a, um, as a music major, um, double major outside of... The music school because that's something that you can do at Miami but can you do it 
um, in a conservatory? Um, there was a girl I knew and she double majored in German. And the thing is, German's at NEC. So honestly, I don't have a whole lot of experience with that. So I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I know that CCM told me, and CCM is the College Conservatory of Music at UC, for those who don't know. Um, CCM told me you could do it. Um, if you really wanted to, especially since UC is a larger school, more than just the conservatory, I, I imagine it's much harder at just a conservatory, like say the Cleveland Institute of Music or NEC, where it's a, a single conservatory, not associated with a larger school. Um, although CIM has Case Western, um, and you have Northeastern. Mm -hmm. Um, we, a lot of cases like at, um, CCM, I am a double major. Uh, my second major is in essentially computer science. At CCM, the computer, or well, at UC, the, the computer science degree has a five-year program with a co-op in the middle of it, and the conservatory couldn't work around that, so I wasn't able to do a double major there. And I think, honestly, the culture is such that it's not particularly put forward as something, it's like something you can do if you really want to, but you gotta really want to do it because the infrastructure is not really there to support you doing a double major so much as it is at a liberal arts school where it's kind of, understood that most people will go out and pick up at least a minor, if not more than that, you know? Mm -hmm. Our curriculum's built in such a way that we have a thematic sequence at the end of our uh, college careers where it's like, you know, this can be substituted with a minor. So it's it's built in such a way that you're encouraged to go out and pick up a second or a third addition to your degree in some ways. And I, I don't think you find that so much at a conservatory. Um, it, it's quite different at Capital. Um, minors and double majors are generally kind of rare um, in the conservatory. Um, certainly there are a few people that double major within the conservatory um, and you're not really advised against it. However, once you start reaching outside of the conservatory, your advisors are going to probably tell you that's not such a good idea. Um, I remember um, when I was um, visiting Capitol before I came, came here, um, I had asked, you know, one of the teachers, would it be possible to double major in music composition and computer science? And he said, no, don't do that. Um, which is obviously different than Miami because you're doing it, right? Right, essentially. So, um, it's just... Um, if you do double major, and even if it's a double major within the conservatory, um, unless you came in with a lot of credit, you're going to probably end up having to take courses over the summer. Yeah. Yeah. If you are a new student trying to choose between a conservatory and a liberal arts school, what would you focus on the most when you go to the schools to question, you know, what is, what would be the most important differentiator to you in finding a college, whether it be a conservatory or a liberal arts school? For me, um, I'll just go ahead and answer my own question. I think the most important factor is having the teacher that's right for you that's what I was at your say. school. I'd I, also add performance opportunities in the area that you're in. Yeah, I, absolutely. I'd say first thing for me in any school is there has to be a teacher for you. If there's no teacher, you're wasting your money going that's to a school for you. And you're actually hurting your voice by going to a school without a good teacher for you. Next would probably be performance opportunities. And performance then. opportunities will give you something on your resume. Mm -hmm. And then the area, depending on what will be available to you, if you need to look for performance opportunities. Yeah. I agree. Those would be my top three. A church or yeah, a absolutely. gig or... Yeah. yeah, I would say do not stress over the difference between the two labels. Uh, just, I would say completely ignore the labels and just look at what the school is and what's there for you and what you're personally interested in. Um, and also consider that uh, conservatories often have a, a, a little bit of a fee associated with them. Uh, so just be aware of that as well. But other than that, just ignore the labels. It does not matter. 
Yeah, I would say um, the teacher is definitely the number one consideration and you should certainly have sample lessons and talk to teachers at schools that you're considering um, before you make a decision. Um, another big one I would say is cost um, with the rising, you know, costs of universities nowadays. Um, you know, you, you want to pick a school that's going to be good to you, but you also want to make sure that there's not another school that has everything that this one school has, but it's a lot cheaper. Um, you know, you, you want to find the best balance between um, teacher and opportunities as well as how in debt you're going to be by the end of it. Um, <laughs> always try to get scholarships, you know, those can always help, but you know, room and board and fees, they, they kind of add up after a while. Um, but yeah, I would say a good balance between finances and your own happiness, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it's worth sacrificing your own happiness. That's but true, yeah. I think finding a nice balance between everything. Yeah. So if you're sure. sacrificing your own happiness, you're making a poor decision. Exactly. <laughs> that is true. That is very true. Um, so when I was looking um, at schools when I was a, a senior in high school and I was picking where I was going to go to school for music. Um, I had both conservatories and liberal arts schools on my list. And in the end, I chose Miami not because it was a liberal arts school um, or really anything to do with that. I chose it because I went to Shadow for a day to just see what it was going to be like to be a student at Miami and everybody, every single person that I met while I was there was so incredibly kind to me and welcoming and really made me feel like I belonged there and that if I went I would be um, welcomed with open arms. And that's why I chose Miami because that was, you know, the experience that I had when I visited. So I'm wondering, what was that like for you guys? Why did you choose where you, where you went to school? Um, mine isn't that interesting. Um, <laughs> I went to New England Conservatory because it was close to home. <laughs> well, you had your grandma too. I also, that's also true. Yes. Okay. So my great grandmother was a teacher at New England Conservatory. She was one of the first people to graduate as a woman at New England Conservatory. And she was renowned there and she was she was pretty cool. <laughs> and so it was pretty cool to walk in her footsteps and I did wanna do that. And I had a lot of people in my family that were saying it would be so cool if you followed in Grandma Jaberti's footsteps and that'd be so cool. And eventually that did sound pretty nice. And everything seemed to be right there for me and I could go home easily and I could see my family, but also I had everything that I needed, whether it had been a perfect submergence into music in a really nice, easy way that I could get in and then have a nice escape back in case, because I also went to public school. I also, I mean, my music department at my public school was being basically taken down. Um, it, I had like, three different music teachers in the course of my time there because none of them would stay and the sports was just taking over and so music really wasn't a big thing but also I figured if I'm going to be a musician like I really want to be I might as well submerge myself the best that I can and then if I need a break I can go home. Um, but also I figured that since it's a conservatory I'd have an intimate relationship with my teacher that would give me the best result. Um, that was, that was the thought process. <laughs> now, legitimately much more boring of a reason oh. to go to school <laughs> other than her wonderful story about her great-grandmother. Um, I auditioned for nine schools when I was looking to apply, um, and I got into all of them. It really came down to what school had a teacher for me and what school was most affordable. And Miami uh, was the most affordable school for me. Um, and they let me do everything that I wanted to do when it came to outside majors. For me, it really came down to three schools, I'd say. It was um, Illinois, or University of Illinois, uh, Indiana University, which is the Jacobs School of Music, or uh, Miami University. And I didn't 
feel that strongly attached to Illinois. So that one kind of came off the list. Indiana, if I got that one teacher, I would have been the only undergraduate in his studio, which sounded like a great idea to me at the time. But uh, he didn't have room because one of his students came back for another year. And so I ended up at Miami, which worked out great because I knew they had teachers that I would trust. It was close to home and it would allow me to they definitely were on board with me taking more than one major. And they even changed around requirements to allow me to take classes that only sophomores would normally take my freshman year and my second major to get me started on it. So Miami became the obvious decision for me when it came to money, especially since you got to save up for grad school after your undergrad when it comes to singing. So when I um, was looking for schools, I knew I was um, wanting to be a composition major, um, but I didn't know if I was uh, going to stick with it. And even if I was, I wanted to keep singing. So I was looking for something with a strong composition program, but also a strong vocal, vocal department. And um, Capital has um, four composition teachers, which is more than most um, places I looked. And the um, vocal department is um, very good, um, especially in proportion with the conservatory. Uh, I think the fact that, you know, the recital hours are split between vocal and instrumental is pretty telling. And the fact that there's like um, 10 studios uh, and also the fact that some people go to Capitol specifically for the choir um, that is here because it's um, it's just um, very good. Um, so um, when it came to the strongest programs, um, you know, Capitol had the best looking uh, composition. Uh, and vocal departments with the most performance opportunities and the faculty there uh, really seemed to actually care about me. Uh, when I all, uh, went to some other schools, um, some of them were telling me uh, to consider, uh, you know, doing a Bachelor of Arts, which I didn't want to do. And um, as <laughs> one, to, one school, I went to a composition interview and the uh, uh, the professors there uh, looked annoyed at me uh, for most of the interview. So, uh, yeah, I, I just, I was able to go to Capitol and I, I really enjoyed my interviews there. And um, um, I, I liked the, the opportunities it presented. So. Great. Well, um, awesome <laughs> thank you guys for um <laughs> agreeing to come talk to us today on our podcast about this topic um i i, I love sort of talking to individual people about their own experience because it's so easy to go on google and look up what's the difference between a conservatory and a liberal arts school but really it it ultimately comes down to um each individual school and what you as a musician and as a student are looking to get out of higher education. Um, and I, I hope that's something that everybody takes away from this is that, um, you know, it doesn't matter what the school says it is or what labels the school has. All that matters is um, the factors that are important to you as a person and whether or not you feel like you will get um, the most out of your time while you're there. So. Thank you guys um, for for coming. Um, if anybody has any last remarks that they want to make, you know, now's the time. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, we're going to listen to a little bit more of the piece that we've been listening to um, for this episode. I hope you guys are enjoying that so far. And I'll come back um, in a few moments to give you some news about the opera world as it is currently.
recent opera news, we have seen many cancellations and postponements as the coronavirus pandemic continues to ravage the world. Opera Australia has postponed their production of Wagner's Ring Cycle until 2021. The production would have premiered in November of this year and was going to be the first fully digital staging of the famous cycle of operas. Likewise, LA Opera has postponed four of their major productions from the 2020 to 2021 season until the 2021 to 2022 season. They hope to resume live productions in January of 2021. Opera Philadelphia has been forced to cancel their O20 Fall Festival, but instead has launched the Opera Philadelphia Channel, where viewers can pay per view to see recorded performances or pay $99 for a subscription. Other opera companies have been pivoting their focuses to revolutionize the way we view opera as well. Austin Opera in Austin, Texas has recently teamed up with the Blue Starlight Drive-In to bring operatic programming to viewers in the comfort of their own vehicles beginning in October. Minnesota Opera presents Opera in the Outfield in September, featuring live and recorded performances all within the St. Paul ballpark. They too will continue virtual streams, as many other opera houses have done, including a November stream of a Wagner classic with provided 3D glasses. To end on a good note, though, Renee Fleming has been announced to return to the Metropolitan Opera in New York City in 2022, starring alongside Kelly O'Hara and Joyce D. Donato in a new operatic adaption of the novel-slash-film The Hours. Fleming has not worked with the Met since 2017, and it will be exciting to see her return, hopefully to a pandemic-free New York. That's all we have for Opera News today, and thanks for listening. We hope that you have learned something new today about the differences between conservatories and liberal arts colleges. While the differences can be big or small, minor or major, what matters most is how they affect the learning and experience of the individual student, and how conducive they are to the student's own needs and wants. A special thank you to our guests today, Maddie and Sam, for their graciousness in agreeing to sit down for this episode. Another special thank you to Nate Wilkins and Madison Wells for advising this episode. The piece featured in this episode is Movement 1 from Beethoven's Wind Octet and E-flat minor, performed in 1981 by the Sony Ventorum Wind Quintet and their assistant players. We would like to thank them for allowing our use of their beautiful music. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. My name is Carrie Sullivan and this has been Maneuvering Music at Miami University. <laughs>